this is my second year coming to the symposium, and okay, let's move it down a little bit. And I'm humbled by the knowledge and the individuals who take part in this. Um, taking a look at those posters and just looking at the research, um, just the, the, the minds and how they think, how everybody thinks about security in so many different ways. Um, you know, not only technically, but also from a management point of view. And you know, for me, that's very important. Um, you know, being a manager for information security for a company, I need to know and understand what everybody is thinking about. So it's very humbling for me to be here. And I have to apologize. I'm going to be using two computers here to do the presentation. One has my notes on it. So what I'm going to do here is just go through the agenda. Um, first of all, just talk about some of the top um, trends and security risks. You may have already heard these already through some of the presentations. Talk about compliance requirements. As an organization, we're very concerned about the regulations and the laws, uh, not only federal and state laws, but also uh, international laws. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our security initiatives, what we do as an organization uh, to help mitigate the risks that we uh, identify and also um, ways for our clients to mitigate those risks. As Gene pointed out, um, this presentation is actually for our clients. We have an annual seminar uh, that we do for our clients and I talk about security and how our organization addresses uh, security. And I'll go a little bit um, give a little bit overview about the organization and why it's important to our clients. I keep looking at there, but there's screens right here. I'm not used to that. Um, the objectives really are just to provide an overview of um, my perspective. What do I see within the organization? What do I deal with on a daily basis? Um, and also just to give you a basic understanding of how one company, Ontario Systems, addresses security. Each company does it differently, but this is our way of doing it. Uh, just a little bit of a background for me, um, about me. Uh, I have 17 plus years in information technology, started off as a programmer, moved into systems, managing systems, Unix, Linux, Windows, I mean, Cisco products, all sorts of stuff. So, you know, I've worked with a lot of different technology. And the reason why I pointed this out is because it was difficult for me to move from that technical aspect of security to management aspect. It's very important when you become uh, a manager uh, of information security in an organization to move from that role of a technical person to a, a, a more of a managerial overview or a managerial um, aspect of information security. Um, you know, I've got some certifications. I think it's very important in today's day and age to continue to learn, um, you know, I'm, it's one of the things I wish I would have done is come to Purdue. I'm finding more and more how important uh, the serious program is, uh, and uh, you know, it's just one of those things that I, I, I find very unique and very, um, uh, very good. Uh, well, not very good, but you know, very important in in the world today. So, what do I really do? Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, my boss just says, just keep me off CNN. Okay, well, that's easy, I think, if you just listen to what I have to say. But really, what I do is I, I manage risk. Um, you know, it's, it's more about focusing on the risks to the organization. You know, I, I keep the awareness of information security um, throughout the organization. I make sure that everybody, not just the officers, not just the directors, but also the employees, every single employee, making sure that they're aware of the latest threats and the vulnerabilities within our organization. Uh, they're very key, and that's one item I'll touch on later about that. Um, you know, incorporate security into the business processes. I think that's very important. How do you get security into the business processes? At what point do you bring it in to those processes? If you don't have it involved, if you don't have security involved within the business processes, you fail. You, become, you come to the back end. They'll come to you at the very end and say, hey, by the way, we're going to put in this system. 
excuse, <clears throat> excuse me. I make sure that our policies address a lot of our contractual obligations. We sign a lot of security agreements for our clients, so I have to make sure that our policies address those, that our employees are trained in the policies and aware of the policies, and why we have these policies in place, what are our contractual obligations, what are the, the laws and the regulations that we have to follow. Uh, also develop the security incident, incident response plan and maintain that so that when something does occur, what do we do? It's, it's a constant learning experience. There's, somebody pointed out, um, it may have been SPAF early on, there's no silver bullet to information security. And a key thing for me is to position Ontario Systems as a secure partner to our clients. One of the things that we recently did was we had a reorganization. We had a new CEO come in. We developed a strategic plan for the organization, laid out a whole new map for the company. And right there, one of those objectives was promote and adhere to security best practices. So I made the strategic map. I'm in. Well, that right there allowed me to say, OK, I want to position Ontario Systems as a secure partner to our clients because it's, it's a strategic goal for us. How can we make our clients better? Ontario Systems, we are a uh, receivable management software solutions company. We develop software. Uh, we deal with 500 clients, healthcare, financial institutions, uh, collection agencies, law firms. So as you can imagine, we have a lot of uh, compliance to deal with. We're famous for our fax software, which is a flexible automated collection software. It's over 25 years old, and it still works. And it was kind of interesting uh, this morning talking about the, the amount of code that increases over the years. And you just watch it the bloat of that code. Excuse me. And you think about, you know, when it started 25 years ago, security wasn't very important to them. It still wasn't important to them five years ago, unfortunately. I think a lot of companies were like that. But to us, we started to realize that. We start building it into our processes. But it's very difficult to take an old system and retrofit it. So that's one of the things we're doing as part of our new development process is putting security in. Well, security matters to who? Matters to just about everybody. It, it's kind of ironic. I had this picture of college students in here. Um, I didn't put it in here just for this presentation. I actually had it in here. And college students, you guys fill out forms. You put your social security number down. You have credit cards. You're worried about that information. Which ones are the college students? <laughs> they, they look younger all the time. They do. They do, don't they? Actually, those are employees down there at the bottom. <laughs> Families, they worry about it. It's dysfunctional, exactly. You know, that was one of the things, you know. When you train security for employees, it is the most difficult, I think, hour or two hours, depending how mean you want to be to your employees that they have to sit there and listen to you talk about security. So you try to make it fun for them. I try to interject things like family guy and you know, maybe some uh, weird anecdotes or things like that. But you know, it's, it's refreshing to be able to talk to peers and individuals, and students who are actually learning about security. But it matters to everybody. Our financial data, when we're on the internet, when we're doing web banking, it's important to us. It really matters. But who is ultimately responsible for security? Everybody is responsible for security. This is a key point that I point out. Key point? A key item I point out to all of our employees, that everyone is responsible for security. It's not me. It's all of the employees. Also take that home with them. You're responsible for your own security on your computer system at home. You need to make sure that your computer is up to date. Otherwise, you're going to lose your financial information eventually. I'd like to point out some of the failures 
this is, uh, like I said, since this is for a presentation for our clients, um, I figured the best way to really make a direct impact is show them. I'm sure they've heard of it, but it never hurts to, to reiterate to, to them that they are making examples of companies now. HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act, was one of those that never really had teeth to it. At least that's what they said. Now, is it HHS or DHS? HHS. They're going after companies now and finding them. So it becomes important for those healthcare agencies to take note. We all heard about TJ Maxx. A mortgage company was fined $50,000 just for throwing out credit reports into a garbage bin. There's an actual law, disposable or disposal safeguards and privacy rule for the protection of credit reports. So they were fined. Heartland, we all heard about that one. That's the latest one. They were dropped by Visa for PCI violations. But the odd thing is, is that they were PCI compliant. So that begs the question then, are these truly the right thing to do to follow the standards? There was a report put out by Verizon Business last year. Over 500, I think they analyzed over 500 cases. This, the risk team goes out and they do incident investigations. So they, they identify, or they research 500 incidents. And this is the percentage of breaches affected, mostly payment card data. 84% of it, which tells you the criminals were going after credit card information. But how could that be? We have PCI. I'm sorry, payment card industry data security standard. Thank you, Gene. PCI was developed by uh, the Payment Card Industry Council based off of Visa and MasterCard and, and Discover Cards safeguard rules. So there were three, four, I think there were four total. Three or four. There were three or four different rules to follow. So as a retailer, you're following a Visa safeguard rule, you're following MasterCard, you're following Discover, and American Express, thank you. So you're following those, well, they needed, or they decided they needed a single rule, a single guideline. So the payment card industry was formed and developed this. But 84% of the breaches were payment card data. Yes, sir. Did you know of those, of those breaches? Microphone. Thank you. Of those breaches, are those failures uh, to follow the standard, or are those cases where someone following, is following the standard and still has a breach? Or does the standard say, if you're breached, you weren't following the standard? They did not investigate if they were PCI compliant or not. Um, but that's a good question. I know that they're coming out with a new report later this, I think next month actually. So it'd be interesting to see if they did address it in there. Yes, sir. A lot of those breaches, a lot of those breaches uh, were insiders. And the PCI standard governs border security and doesn't do a very good job with insider threat. So many of them, like Heartland, uh, some of Heartland's and some of the other ones, were insiders taking the information, and that isn't covered. Yes, I think I have that information in the slide down the road. I thought it was in the next slide. I'd like to show this. Oh, I'm sorry. 
as in the heartland case in which our malware was installed on the on the heartland's computers right in the in the heartland's case so i think they were pci dss compliant so is there a problem with that pci dss standard or what is happening is is the standard imperfect because the company followed it but then also they got they got attacked and i think the transaction volume was around 100 million transactions per month or something so they so a lot of credit card information got leaked so so if a company followed that and then also they got attacked so what's the use of pci dss so. that's a very good question and that's one that's being asked a lot now but i think the problem is that the pci compliance is at a point in time so when they come in and conduct the audit that day you're compliant but if the following day you were to make a change to your systems or introduce a new system or a network configuration you may be out of PCI compliance so isn't there a way in PCI DSS which actually take care of uh, preventing some malware or some other stuff getting installed on the on a on a client's machine i think there are some safeguards for that also so that actually inherently points to the weakness in the PCI DSS standard so it was not perfect nobody uh, nothing is perfect so that's why malware actually came in the systems and it yes and, and it's true and it points back to it's about processes the processes need to ensure that you're secure if your processes aren't correct then you're not secure if you allow malicious software to be installed on your systems we know there's multiple ways to mitigate that take away admin rights put in a software application that monitors what's being installed bit 9 is one of those um, you know there's there's other ways lock down the keyboard put it in a cement room you know those kind of things but yeah it, it's true and it's a big question that's being asked nowadays is it truly does it truly work and, 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 but that's the problem is there's no you know for information security there's no rules there's again there's no golden bullet for information security we have to start somewhere there th th exactly there are minimums those are minimum requirements for us to maintain security within our environments it's very difficult especially in our environment where we have to deal with so many different uh, compliance regulations um, you know th they're all across the board so a lot of them most of them are really up to interpretations unfortunately HIPAA GLBA and they're up and they're up to interpretations they're really up to the auditors in my mind when the auditor comes in it's whatever they think is right yes sir so it's just a, just a quick one so Essentially, PCI DSS is just a, a check checkpoint, and there's no requirement to document the processes. I, I, I looked at it briefly. I didn't get that part. Um, it's it it's about yeah. It's it's about. Um, I want to say it's more about protecting the network. They talk a lot about. Um, not protecting the network, sorry, protecting the credit card information. They focus a lot on the storage and the encryption and the transmission of that information. Uh, they do talk a little bit about change management of your processes, your firewall, for example. Make sure you have a change management uh, process in place for changes to the firewall. And correct me if I'm uh, missing something here, Gene, but I, th you know, I think you know, their main focus is about the credit card information. So it kind of, you know, again, it's those blinder kind of things, I, I, I think, that makes it difficult. Um, you know, they talk about segmenting the network. Well, the true purpose of segmenting the network for them, for PCI, is to reduce the scope of the audit. So when the auditors come in, they only have to focus on that section of the network of where that credit card information is being transmitted. So if you allow it to be transmitted throughout the entire organization, you're looking at a very long audit. If you can segment that off into a little section, it makes the audit a little bit easier. I'm going to go ahead and move on here. Um, some really great questions, though. Um, you know, out on the black market, they sell your data. 
They sell your identity. Now, these are some numbers I found a little while ago, 10 to $25 per individual. I'm beginning to question that. I don't think it's as much that, that much money anymore for identities. I think they're truly just going after credit card information and, uh, as we po it was pointed out today, intellectual property. The cost for data breach, and I'd really like to point this out, uh, especially to the executive levels. This is one of the things that I use whenever I find a client data file on our network that's not stored in accordance with our policies. I'll count the number of records and multiply that. I don't have the number up there, but the I think it's $197, give or take a few dollars there per record that would cost a company if that information were breached. Yes, sir. Do you carry breach insurance? Uh, do you carry breach insurance? Breach insurance? Uh, no, we don't. Should you? You know, that question was brought up a while ago. Um, I'm, and to be honest, I'm not really sure. It was posed to the executives, and I just let them run with it. You know, but that's really a question, you know, should you carry it? You know, what's the impact? Again, do your business impact analysis. You know, what's the impact to the organization? What's the cost of the insurance? The reason, I, the reason I ask that is that it's the one of the few places that people are selling insurance successfully in this area because the costs are kind of well understood. We know how many letters, we know how much it costs to pay lawyers, we know how much credit monitoring costs. And just to, you know, the idea is that we sometimes insure things that which we understand. The part we don't understand is just seems too hard. Very true. And that's one of my difficulties as part of the risk management is pointing out to the executives what's the true cost and how do you mitigate that. The last line on here, we connect to our clients to support our products. We have a network connection to them. This last line was very important to our organization. Um, this report was put out uh, actually in February of this year by the Potimon Institute. 44% of the respondents said that the breaches were caused by third party. We are a third party to our clients. I can guarantee if they look at this report, they're going to start thinking there's a big risk for us is Ontario Systems. So we need to, as an organization, address that. The same Verizon report showed that 80% the difficulty levels of a breach were low and moderate, which meant a little to very little knowledge was required. It's big business nowadays for criminals to either sell or buy the tools to do a data breach, to go out and steal information, steal identity. Well, the scary part was 52% were just low. Automated tools and script kitties. A little more than half of the data breaches were caused by run-of-the-mill scripts. You're all familiar with this, but I like to point this out to our employees and to our clients. This is a small list, as you know, of the different vulnerabilities. And as I was reviewing this again today, I added in, on the vulnerability side, for web browsers and office software, I said improperly coded. We always, from the information security side, we look at it as being improperly patched. Do we have the right processes in place to patch those? When the reports come out, 30 days after we do our testing, we patch the systems. Is that really the vulnerability, or is it because they're improperly coded? Start to question that. 
You know, but really the bottom line for all these, as I started to look at them even deeper, was really a lack of procedures, a lack of processes. If you don't have a patch process, your web browsers are going to be exploited. Your software will be exploited. If you don't have the right processes in place. To us as an organization, to Ontario Systems, we have to, originally indirectly, we had to meet with the compliance requirements of all these different regulations and laws. We had a contractual obligation to our clients and an ethical obligation to protect their data. Well, one of the changes to HIPAA in the stimulus plan that was just signed by President Obama in February was the business associates, which are third parties that have access to protected health information, are now liable. We are responsible for reporting the breach. Prior to that, it was the covered entity, it was the healthcare, it was the hospital, or whoever was handling or was actually responsible for the data. This was a big change for us. We became liable. It directly addressed us as an organization. You know, we deal with a lot of different companies in a lot of different markets. We have public companies. We deal with financial institution, credit unions. Our software takes credit card payments from debtors. Yeah, I know, it sounds a little weird. But keep in mind that not all debtors are really in debt, especially in healthcare. They get a lot of bills from their doctor. It's difficult to pay those all off at once. So what they'll do is they'll create payment plans. We'll take credit card payments. You know, it's easy. We also do skip tracing with our software, so we deal with credit reports. So we have to worry about making sure our clients can comply with that regulation about disposing the credit reports in a timely manner. Uh, the red flag rule, which just came out, was about being able to identify identity theft. What are those flags that you have in place to make sure that that information was not compromised, that somebody, especially an insider, did not compromise that data, did not steal that information. We have Canadian companies. We deal also with company in Europe indirectly through one of our other United States companies, but we still have to know and understand the laws and regulations in the foreign companies because we still have access to that data. The one thing I like is that it seems to me that in the foreign, uh, we call them foreign, but Europe and in the United Kingdom and Canada, they have those federal privacy laws, those protections, those privacy protection acts. That's one thing we lack here. We have, what is it, 44 states now that have data breach laws, each one different in a little way. So that becomes a little cumbersome. There's some identity theft bills that are pending. So as you can see, this is a lot of what I deal with also. I have to keep track. I have to monitor. I report this information to our executives to make sure that they're aware there's a possibility we may be affected by these laws, either directly or indirectly. For our clients, like I stated earlier, we do have connections to our clients' data to connect and support our product. So we have a contractual obligation an ethical obligation to protect the privacy of that information. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions, I don't, I don't even know how many, if we were to go out to all of our 500 clients and grab that information. Millions upon millions upon millions of people. It's scary. We also want to make sure that our clients can comply with those regulations. How? Because we access that data. So they conduct audits of us 
to make sure we have policies and procedures in place to protect this information. I want to ensure them, again, going back to being a secure partner for our clients. Yes, sir. You're, are you warehousing the data? You, you're providing your software as a service, and you're warehousing the data in-house? Or I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit confused because I'm not sure if you're deploying your software at your customer site, or could you just clarify a little bit, please? I can. Up until maybe, let's see, what month is this? This is March, so up until maybe July, the software we would sell it to our clients. It would be installed in our client's environment. The clients would be ultimately responsible for the security of that information. We have a business plan on the table now where we will start software as a service. That changes the name of the game for the organization. And that, that, was, that was quite a learning experience for me also. That was one of the things I had to deal with as a security person is, wow, you, you know, this is crazy. Now we're directly responsible for this information. Do you realize what that's going to cost us? What we have to do to, put, to make sure this information is protected? But as a manager, I know that there's strategic goals that we have to meet. So I have to step back and take a look. I have to take off my technology hat and start looking at the risks, develop my risk report, hand it to the executives. Guys, this is what I think we need to do. Sat down with the executives, and they said, you're right, Rick. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We'll accept this for now, but we're going to monitor it. That's a very big, I want to say a big win for me because I think it, it really pointed out to the executives that we do have risks involved. But we also have to make sure we monitor those risks. And I, and I think that uh, you know, when we look at this, this list of the threats, we have to worry about all these. Yes, sir. You mentioned risk reports and, and talking to the board. How do you quantify these risks? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> That's one of the hardest things in information security is quantifying the risks. Now, it's easy, you know, if you have a file of 50,000 records, you can go out and see what the research has estimated cost $197 per record. So I can easily quantify that. 50,000 records times 197, this is how much it could cost the organization. But What's the perceived cost? What's it going to cost us if we were to lose a client? What's it going to cost us to not make that sale? What's it going to cost us in the long run? We're a private company, so our stocks aren't going to go down and then go back up a couple days later. And our, you know, somebody who makes 300%, I thought that was really cool. I'll be at home tonight looking see who's had the latest threat or latest compromise. Um, but you know, that's one of the most difficult things as a information security manager is to come up with those quantifiable measures. You know, it's more about what do we think is going to happen if this happens. There's, you know, you've got a couple different, um, couple different uh, algorithms out there like AL and um, you know I, I don't even know if you can use a return on investment in that case you know is it really an investment when you put security controls in place it could be so it's very difficult to quantify that information best guess maybe you know among, among the existing standards for risk management, which one, which one you recommend the most? I hate using this term, but that depends. Um, for me, what I did was I started off with something very basic and simplistic, but I used the NIST as my basis, um, 800, I think dash 53. Um, but I used that as the basis. I took a look at Microsoft's. They have a very thorough risk assessment, risk management 
process. But it was, to me, it was just too cumbersome. I want to make it simplistic. It has to be simplistic when you report it. You know, that was one of the, that was a trial and tribulation I had to go through, is developing that right framework, that right way to report it to the executives. How do I appropriately provide an information to them in a nice little graph? Because executives like graphs. They like to see that. They like to see charts and pretty colors, unfortunately. And that, you know, that was something that I developed off of that. And using the NIST one was very basic, I felt. And it was very good for our environment. Our clients want to know, and really anybody, when you connect to their network, they're going to want to know this. Who is connected? Why are they connecting? What are they using? How are they connecting? When are they connecting? When are they logging off? This is very important to our clients because they have to have the audibility in place. They have to prove that that person who logged into their system to support the product was on there for a reason, not just to jump on, to take a look because they felt like it. But there has to be a purpose. There has to be a business reason for that person to be on their system. They have to be authorized. They need to know. This is one of our um, one of the slides I show also to um, our new employees to give them an idea of what the objectives are of information security. As you can see, I used the three big three big security terms right there: confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So as a company, what do we do to help us with information security? We are SAS 70 Level 2 certified. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you if you have the right controls in place. I think that's, that's one of the faults of SAS 70. So we're going to utilize ISO 27001 to help us develop a framework to determine if we have the right controls in place. And one of the students did a poster on incorporating COBIT and, um, okay, scoreboard, scoreboard yes. Um, I was hoping to talk to him because he also, they also had in there uh, about ISO. And I thought that was very interesting how they proposed to utilize those different tools. We also have a business continuity plan, and we use a product called SecureLink, which is a third-party application. It allows us to connect to our clients securely, but also allows us to audit those connections and uniquely identify who is connecting to their systems. We have over 300 people supporting our products. Any one of those individuals can, can connect to a client system at any given time. So it's very important for us to be able to identify who is connecting. Prior to me taking the position of security manager, we had land-to-land -land connections. We would directly connect to their network. There was no authentication method. Our clients would just allow us to jump on at any given time. It was easy. It was convenient. ISO 27001, like I said, is a framework, allows us to identify all the different regulations and, and requirements that we have to follow or clients have to follow, allows us to map those out, develop a matrix for all those different requirements and if the right controls are in place. I made a comment about insurance. Five minutes, thank you. Fire insurance, everyone has, should have fire insurance. You don't think there's going to be a fire. You don't want a fire, but you have it as a protection because it could happen. But I'd like to point out that in a lot of organizations, they feel that a firewall 
is much like their insurance. You put it in, I'm safe, but it's not. There's more than just having a firewall within the organization. Now, it's unfortunate a lot of small and medium-sized size businesses don't have people who are responsible for security within the organization. And this is one of the reasons why I like to point this out, because it goes above and beyond just having a firewall in place. Not only does it go above and beyond these technical controls, but the processes, the risk management, all of that. But it's difficult for a small or medium-sized business without a security person to truly understand anything beyond this. When we talk about risk management, this is what we do. This is my process. Very simple, six steps. Identify it, evaluate it, prioritize it, plan on how we're going to mitigate it, implement that plan, and monitor it. There's always going to be residual risks. There's going to be gaps, but it's how you monitor those gaps and how you go back and repeat the process. That's one of the things I'm working with right now with our IT department. They're trying to find the right golden bullet to segment our network so that we can go for a PCI audit, so we can keep only the credit card information on those machines. Well, they're looking for that golden bullet. They want to put all these tools in place, all these technical you know, pieces of hardware. I said, guys, let's not try to bite it all off at once. Let's just do a little bit of a time. We can't get it all in the budget this year. Let's take a look at what we have left, put it on the risk report, identify it as a gap, monitor it. Next year, we'll address it. And that's a key point of ISO 27001 also. It's about continual process improvement. You continually improve your processes. Systems change, people change, software changes. As soon as you've put in that control, I guarantee it's going to change the next day. So ways to mitigate risks. This is what I like to tell our, our clients. Make sure you know where your regulated data is stored. Control how it's accessed. Make sure when we ask, uh, ask, ask for access that there's a business reason for it. Don't just blindly allow us to connect. Make sure you secure your perimeters. You know, look for vendors with SAS 70 and ISO 27001. Marketing employee, yes, we're SAS 70. We're going to be ISO. There's a benefit to it. You know, follow best practices. I like to point out some of these. These are pretty basic. Nothing, and I don't think any of these would surprise anyone here, really. But it's unfortunate because a lot of the small and medium-sized businesses just don't know or understand the best practices. Yes, sir? As in ISO 27001 is about best practices, right? So everybody, uh, every auditing company, as in, uh, in, interprets these best practices according, in accordance with uh, how did they implement the security, right? So is there a set standard as in, because I looked at some OSTMM that, so can you just throw some light on that as in some OSTM as in some set standard to set the security of that stuff, of the standards of the best practices that are mentioned in the ISO 27001? ISO 27001 is really about managing risk. Mm -hmm. It's about developing a process to manage that risk. Mm -hmm. Those six steps that I showed, that's our process for managing risk. 27002 are the controls that you use to mitigate those risks identified in your process. So it's, it's a little bit more I think it's a little bit more than just developing a security program. It's about developing uh, a method to manage that risk. Um, one of the things that I like to point out is information security, no. It's about managing risk. It's a big shift, I feel, from information security to risk management. 
And that's what ISO 27001 allows us to do. Develop policies to meet the business objectives, not as a reaction to a problem, but to meet business objectives. Employees are key. Training and awareness programs are very important within an organization. I like to do a security bulletin each week, and I like to make it personal to the individuals and point out to them that, you know, it's not just about being here in the company, protecting the company, but when you go home, I want you to think about it. When you get on your computer at home and log in and pay your financial information, go on to your bank, you know, your, your bank's website. If your system's compromised, your information's going to be compromised. Learn the business goals and map those back to security. And always, always remember, management will accept risk. I think one of the most frustrating things for me that I had to learn is that there are so many risks that you can't address all of them. You have to learn to accept some of those. My job is really to identify that risk, report those risks to the officers, to the executives, and let them choose whether or not we want to accept or mitigate or transfer those risks. When our CEO started, that was one of the first questions he asked me. He said, who's ultimately responsible for security? I just looked at him, I said, you are. What do you mean? I said, I'm going to give you the reports. I'm going to identify all the risks. I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you, I can tell you what to do, but I can't tell you if, you're go if we're going to spend the money to mitigate those or if we're just going to accept those. That ultimately comes up to you. Now, it is my responsibility if I don't provide you with the right reports, if I don't identify all the risks, if I miss those risks, and we end up on CNN, then that's my responsibility. That's my fault. That's where I take accountability. But I know at the end of the day when I identify the risks and report those to the officers and they choose to accept them, you know what? I can't get frustrated about it. They're the ones who are running the business. There's a lot of security practitioners out there right now who do get frustrated with that because they know that's very important to put the controls in place. I have to show this. I remember I read this a couple years ago. I wish I saved the magazine, but I thought this really, really brought it to a point. This tells, tells it all, I think. I was allowed to take this. I took this to our executives and said, this allows us to keep our jobs. This allows us to keep the company functioning. If we can't promise our clients that we could protect their data, we're not going to sign new agreements, new contracts. We're not going to move into new markets. We're not going to become global if we don't have security processes in place. Thank you, sir. This is great. And the rest of this, I just had some sources. There's a IBM X Force puts out a report mid-year and end of the year. I think is a really, really great report when it comes to um, security. They identify the different systems and vulnerabilities and percentages. I think it's a really great report. You might want to check that out. Any other questions? Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.